Welcome to the Traveling Image Makers Podcast, your source of inspiration about travel photography. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride as we bring you on a tour around the world with our guests. Hi, Pete. Good to see you. Hey, how are you doing, Ugo? Buongiorno. I'm doing well. I see your Italian is improving. <laughs> <laughs> Just just drinking Italian wine, that's about it. I see, I see. So I was watching our, uh, our website and uh, just remembering from when you were on, on the show previously, and I, I checked, and I see that you were, you were there first on episode 96, which was, I mean, I couldn't believe it when I saw it. It was recorded and published more than three years ago. It Are you in, kidding me? It was in October 2017. No way. Yeah, it's been That's three years. almost, yeah. Wow. It's been it three years be since we've known each other, ago. essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And then we, we personally, we met face to face when I came to, uh, to Penang, Georgetown in Malaysia. Yeah. Right? Uh, we met together with uh, our common friend, Matt Brandon, and that was September 2019. Maybe that's why the, the interview doesn't seem like that long ago, because it's only been like a year, oh, a little over a year since we met. Per, yeah, face but, to face. I mean, yes, but we also, I mean, not, not many people. Well, we talk this, every this, week. We, 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 meet, we have this little group of friends, including <laughs> Matt, that where we, every week we meet virtually over right. Zoom and we, right. we talk about photography, life and everything. Our water cooler group. Water cooler group, exactly. So it's not like we have a lot to, to catch up. Well, to catch right. up uh, to do right. between us, but maybe our our listeners uh, haven't been, been five days. Five days, come on! It's been, so what happened in those five days? How have you been? <laughs> so well, but for for the listeners here, uh, it's, uh, all good with you with this with this COVID situation and everything. I know we're yeah we're talking about traveling across Asia and all the places we would love to see and we would certainly see soon, but then. COVID happened and uh, things have right. been a bit uh, more complicated, at least for me to, to come visit Asia has been near impossible. And also I think uh, travel within Asia is a bit restricted. Yeah, uh, you can't go anywhere. Everything's closed pretty much. They tried to do this bubble between, um, I know like uh, Singapore and Hong Kong, they tried to do a travel bubble, but it, it didn't work there. The, the numbers went up in Hong Kong. Um, but it's, um, yeah, for me, this past year, I feel like I haven't really produced much work. Like, it's really thrown me off. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I was just doing this exercise the other day about a top 10. You know, you get your, what are your top 10 photos from 2020? And I went to Instagram and I looked and I think I've uploaded maybe five or seven photos in all of 2020 so far. And... Uh, half of those I think were photos that I took years ago. And now that I had all this time, I went back and was editing some old photos that I, I wanted to go back to. But, um, and I've taken some other photos. I just haven't, you know, shared them on social media or whatever, but I haven't really taken many photos. It's, uh, I, I didn't realize so much time has gone by without actually doing so little compared to what I've done in the past. And I think part of that is definitely COVID, not being able to travel, but also just having everything just thrown out of whack. You know, you're, you're, you're so focused on what's happening in the world and to you and your, your family and your friends. And just it's, it's harder to focus for me, at least it has been on photography. Yeah, same here. I didn't actually count or measure my output during the year but I've, I've got a feeling that it's definitely uh, not at the same level as the previous years definitely i've been traveling less i was uh, fortunate to be able in the summer when many of the restrictions here were relaxed to take a two-week trip across italy and, and visiting a, a lot of places that i had kind of taken for granted right uh, i mean it's, it's not the same for you as an expat but for me, living in Italy, but always uh, wanting to see other countries. Uh, and it's, it's not that I have not traveled across Italy a lot in the past. I actually have. But 
every year we were thinking of where, where, where can we go, where can we either with, uh, with family for vacation, also organizing a photo tour for customers. I've always been wanting to, to see new places. And this is why uh, in 2019, I, I thought, well, we should maybe go to Southeast Asia, which I don't know much. So in, in the space of a couple of weeks, so we've been to Singapore and Malaysia, a couple of places there. And then also um, uh, Siem Reap and Angkor in, in Cambodia just because it was so so easy and convenient to travel there but this year okay what do we do we 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 visit italy our own country and we i wanted to visit a, a lot of places that i always uh, heard about or seen on photos or videos but i never never visited personally and rediscovered or discovered those places for the first time that was just just great and relatively close to home just had to to get on the car and drive south, for example, and, uh, and see a lot of, uh, of places that have been on my radar for a long time, but was just there. Like you take them for granted and you never think you, you can, I can go visit them anytime and then you end up never visiting them, which is a pity. This is one of the, the beautiful byproducts, if you could call it that, of everybody being stuck at home is that, you know, these photographers that we follow, our friends, they're going to places that they normally don't go to. We, we don't normally go to our own backyard. We always want to take those big trips and go abroad. Uh, but it's great to see the eyes of, of your country or someone's country through somebody who lives there. And for instance, your photos, uh, your, your trip that you took through Italy, central and southern mm -hmm. Italy, uh, I had never seen those places. Of course, there's the standard photos, iconic photos of the Dolomites, Dolomiti, or Cinque Terre, you know, Florence, Firenze, that we all see. But then you had some like this castle up on the side of a mountain, uh, that colorful village, the fishing village with all mm -hmm. the colorful houses. I mean, there are things I had never seen. I, I think you even mentioned you were like, oh, I was surprised myself. Like, I didn't really see those either. <laughs> So it's been fun kind of exploring, you know, your country with you, somebody who's lived there and the same that with, with other photographers that I follow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I just, uh, some of the places be became my new favorites. So I need to, to, some of those I went there, the light conditions were not great. So I didn't publish any photos. So now I want to go back and photograph them again, hoping for, for better light. Yeah, it's been, uh, at least I was able to take that trip this year. So it's, uh, it's not been completely uh, lost. <laughs> yeah, It's been good. So, so I had to shift my, my perspective and rearrange my priorities. I mean, I was uh, hoping in, in 2020 to do a good number of photo tours uh, around the world. And I just had, was able to do one. And it was the, the Venice Carnival workshop just before the COVID exploded in Italy. It was, I was there in Venice on, it was Saturday, February 23rd, I believe, when we just shut down, they shut down the Venice Carnival Hall three days before the, the, the official end. I remember that you were, you were with, um, Arlene. Arlene. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember her coming back and saying like, I just left there and like, you know, I think she was saying, do I have, you know, she wasn't sick or anything, but I mean, that was kind of the epicenter at the start in Europe and, and she had just left there. So, yeah, she was actually, uh, she stayed in Italy longer than that because she, she had planned mm. to, to go to Florence after Venice and spend yeah. some time there, which, which she actually did, but she was kind of uh, unsure if she were ever able to, to go back to, to Canada, to her hometown because of the flights being blocked or whatever she was until the last minute she was not even sure she could uh, board her flight back to to canada wow it was a bit of a crazy crazy situation and it's it's still crazy i mean we right now it's uh, it's winter here weather here in the in the city is not great it's kind of gray it's, we had a little snow but we are having a ton of snow in the mountains and we oh, cannot really? even go skiing. <laughs> I can't imagine that. All of those places must be losing so much money. 
Yeah. Yeah, so let, let's not just talk about the COVID blues because <laughs> it's been <laughs> our favorite subject. Favorite subject, so <laughs> bit repetitive and so on. Um, let's talk one, about the let's talk about the dolphins in in, in, in Venice. Venice. Yeah, that in the was, canals I mean, for, of Venice. For, for those who didn't don't get it, the, the reference when after we had our initial weeks of lockdown and Venice was empty, no tourists there, right? So. And no, no boats or gondolas in, in the canals, which meant that the, the, the canals of Venice, I mean, Venice is beautiful, the, the canals are something really unique and wonderful, but there's a lot of boat traffic between public traffic, tra public transportation in Venice is exclusive. I mean, it, in Venice, the, the old city at least, is exclusively on water. In private transportation as, as well, there are, Boats of all types, not just the gondolas, but uh, vaporettos and, and other types of boats, like the ambulances in Venice are boats. Okay, so there's a lot of water traffic, and this water causes a lot of turbulence in the water. So the, the water in the, the Venice canals is not normally clean and transparent, it's quite muddy and green, gr green brown. So it's not great looking great, but when all the traffic there essentially stopped, if not for essential services, all the sand, the silt that was suspended in the water and continually agitated because of the traffic there, just settled down to the bottom and the canals became, the, the water became clear again. So you saw those videos of uh, uh, clear water in the Venice Canal with people uh, shooting videos of fish there and, and birds which normally are not there. And then some people mounted a, a fake video of dolphins in the Venetian. Well, or actually, it was a video from dolphins in another a port on a seaside town. And they'd say, oh, this is the dolphins in Venice. And some people actually believed that you could see dolphins in Venice, but that, that was well, not the case. That some people was me. And it was funny when you posted that on Facebook. <laughs> I was like, Oh, that's really not real. And I feel like I know if something's fake or not, you know, like you, I was like, that does kind of sound real. I mean, there's been otters in, uh, I've seen otters in Singapore. Uh, they have this like uh, otters and they walked up onto the street. They do that sometimes anyways, but they got braver. You know, um, I was here during the lockdown and they got braver and were like in the streets mm -hmm. and they, they were, it was like a, in the newspapers. Yeah, so you can, even when you're locked down, you can go shoot wildlife. <laughs> or you could, right. I mean, yeah, we have those videos with deer and boar coming into cities that were almost empty, so they were becoming braver. And right. So you had opportunities for shooting wildlife in a city. <laughs> uh, anyway, you, you mentioned Singapore. Yes, I know you've been spending uh, some time there recently. Uh, and last time we, we talked, we talked about... Uh, our first episode, we talked about your favorite places in Asia. I don't know which ones you, you mentioned. I don't remember exactly. Uh, but then we, we met again in, uh, in Georgetown, Penang, and we mostly spoke about Georgetown. So maybe we can talk a little bit about Singapore and your, your favorite photo spots there. And another thing is that <clears throat> after we met in Penang, I actually spent a couple of days in Singapore, and I explored it on my own. Uh, and I, I also wrote a blog post about it, but um, you spent definitely more time than me there. So you can tell us about your, uh, what's so great about Singapore and to, to photograph there, especially from a photographic point of view. Um, but maybe we can talk about other destinations in Asia if you'd like. I also would like to talk about um, how you shifted your, your, your business, your activities, of course, like all of us more from, from a live in-person uh, situation, more from a, to an online uh, world, because I mean, I've been doing education in person for, and I was hoping to do more, but I had to, sh to shift my attention more to the online world and how you're coping with that. So these were my ideas for this episode. And I've been talking a lot <laughs> Ready? I think people are here to listen to to the guests. Okay, speaking. So I give the the microphone to to you. Let Let's talk about Singapore and what you like. All right. About. Yeah. Well, let's see. I've I moved to Asia in uh, 2007 and lived in South Korea, 
Um, I've lived in Malaysia. Uh, I've lived for a bit of time in, in Singapore as well. And so I, and I've always visited Singapore too from time to time. And, and every time I went there, I'd always wanted to go back. It's a weird kind of place because even though it's not a very big city, if you compare it or country, but the downtown city area, let's say, it's not very big uh, compared to, say, a Hong Kong or Shanghai or something like that, Tokyo or whatnot. So it, it's, it's small enough that you can really wrap your head around it. You know, you, walk, you can walk around for a day and you've seen a lot of the main sites. It's, it's a kind of smallish place. But um, I always, every time I left, I always felt like I wanted to go back. I always felt like I missed something or there was more to see. Um, so for me, the... Probably the highlight of, of Singapore is really the architecture. There's a lot of just amazing modern architecture. Um, in fact, this, this photo here is Singapore. This building right here that looks like a UFO is the Supreme Court. Yeah, pretty sure it's the Supreme Court building. And it's unlike any building I've ever seen anywhere. I mean, it's a, it literally looks like a UFO on top of this building. It's so strange. Um, this shot, by the way, is uh, it's a reflection. So it's in Photoshop. I just uh, mirrored one side to the other. But of course, it's circular. So when you mirror it, the, it actually looks, this building looks more or less like this, even as a mirror. But obviously, the cityscape here is, is the, the so mirror. For, for, for those who are only listening to the audio version of this. Uh, oh, I forgot. We're going yeah. to, no, that's okay. We're going to put a, a copy of that photo on. Uh, yeah. Uh, how do you call them? The show notes that go together with yeah. these episodes at ttim.photo. So uh, people will be able to see, or I guess they can see them on your website, maybe. We share a link to the exact page on your website for that photo. Okay, cool. So, yeah, the, the Singapore um, also has, so I like a lot of street, I'm not street photography, I like a lot of architectural photography. I do a lot of night photography. I like cityscapes. I like especially modern cityscapes. And what else? Um, there's a lot of street. You can do some street photography here. There's uh, one area called like Little India. You could walk around there. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Um, Chinatown. There's a lot of festivals here. There's always stuff going on. The Festival of Light or the, the Full Moon Festival. There's just always something happening here, and they really like to decorate their city with lights and lasers. Uh, of course, you have the Marina Bay Sands. That's sometimes it's blue, sometimes it's red. Sometimes they like decorate it with other stuff. So, yeah, there's just um, something about it that just keeps drawing me back, and and it's also just a really comfortable city to live in. It's not or and to travel in. It's not like a Shanghai or Hong Kong, which, uh, you know, it's just a f has that frenetic pace to it. For me, Singapore feels like one big living room. You know, of course, it has traffic and whatnot, but, but in general, there's a lot of green spaces and a lot of places to just relax. Yeah, I mean, I've, been, uh, I've only been like three days in Singapore and actually all... Uh, if she is listening to these episodes, to my friend Carolyn, um, who used to live in Singapore, she doesn't live there anymore. But when I was there, she she showed us all the, the best places. Uh, as you say, the, the architecture is is fantastic, and I think it's uh, it's changing like all those places. Right, they, every year there there's new buildings, and all these architects are racing to create the most unusual building uh, or. Uh, right or structure there, so you can go back and find new things every time. So the, the architecture, the Marina Bay, the gardens by the bay uh, are, are incredible. All the downtown, uh, still it has little bits of pieces of the uh, old Singapore, right? You got the, the Ruffles, for example, the, the Ruffles Center, right in the middle of downtown, or the, the area along the river, which is kind of a, a touristy now, right, with those, uh, old warehouses that are turning to bars and restaurants and shops, but I think still has a feeling of that. It's not being completely 
torn down and replaced it by high rises. And, and Little India, you mentioned, <coughs> I, I didn't expect it. It's, it's a wonderful place with those pastel, bright color houses with all dozens of right. different colors. It's an, a never ending. I, I, loved, I loved shooting there because every little alley and street created an, an incredible backdrop for, for photography. Right. I, I love street photography. Maybe I, I do it a bit, a bit more than, than you do. But, and I love being there because it could just stand in front of one of those rows of colored buildings and wait for a lady in a colored sari walk in front of those with matching or contrasting colors and creating those, those situations. And it's the people there, um, Chinatown too, I'm sure there are other places where uh, uh, um, where you can you you can find other if you stay there longer than just the three days that I did and find interesting places uh, and people are friendly. The atmosphere is mostly relaxed. It's not as frenetic as other big cities. So uh, I definitely loved it and I, and I would love to to go back. Um, I found it. I mean, not not as expensive as some people told me it would be, honestly. So, I I loved it. Yeah. There, I'm looking for the other place. There's another spot. Um, there's a mosque, and I'm drawing a blank on the name. Is it Bugis? Uh, I can't remember. I'll I'll tell it to you if I find it. But uh, it had yeah. That's the same thing. There's a lot of little alleyways. And you know, colorful shop houses. Um, also, the Katong. Uh, there's a street called Jucha. It's out of the center, mm -hmm. but this that area around there, they have a lot of these old shop houses and kind of pastel, candy-colored houses. A lot of people, if you like Instagramming, you know, taking uh, pictures, you know, with your partner in front of these buildings, holding balloons or whatever. It's quite popular. It just has this kind of old world. There, so there is some kind of old old charm to it and on that note there's also these old apartment blocks uh, which have a lot of character to them i mean some really interesting uh there's one called is it called the china complex or it's right in chinatown it's you've probably seen photos of it it's a very popular kind of instagram spot or iconic photo spot it's this huge um apartment block with all these windows and, and air conditioner units. And a, and a lot of times when it rains, people go to the parking lot and they get a reflection shot. Uh, but it's just one of those kind of overwhelming architectural shots with just rows and rows of windows. And you're just like, you know, that place is massive. Yeah, another place that I, I loved was the area around, uh, I think it's called Waterloo Street. I know. think that's, yeah. The, the neighborhood is called maybe Kampong Bankulan or something like that. And if you've never been there, you, you should. It's um, the, the interesting thing about the area is there's a market there, which is mm -hmm. just like another market, nothing really special with those uh, stalls uh, in, in the middle of this. It's a pedestrian street, right? So they, they put those cars with, they sell food and, and clothes and other things. But the interesting thing about the area is that in a very small area, uh, there's um, there's a Chinese traditional Chinese uh, folk uh, religion temple. I don't not really able to identify any better than that. There's a Hindu temple in the same street, and along the I, I don't remember if it's the same street, but it's a short walk by. There's some, uh, a mosque, a Muslim mosque, and there's also a synagogue nearby, hmm. which we didn't see. So. It reflects a lot of the multicultural uh, aspects of Singapore, which at the, ens at the en essence, I mean, I, I think the majority of the population is uh, of Chinese descent. But there's a, a lot of Indians, like this um, one of the number one uh, uh, Indian populations in, in Asia outside of India, probably. Uh, there's a lot of Malay people. And there's also this little Jewish community. I don't know where they're coming from, but they have a synagogue there. And it's all in a, in a space of a few streets. And it has those um, uh, apartment buildings, government-sponsored, I believe, that you can, with those balconies where you can go. And people live on the balconies, and they just there's all ladies sitting on chairs there just chatting or 
remember a lady was uh, suing and she I took her photo she smiled for me or other ladies were just uh, uh, preparing food for for lunch or dinner for the family and that's that's incredibly interesting and then it started raining so i spent like i was my with my wife and friends and they were just okay we just uh, wait here until the rain goes away under this uh, awning and i was madly shooting photos of people with umbrellas running under the rain and with the water splashing <laughs> i had a lot of fun but my wife was just there oh let's wait for the rain to stop so let's right. let's not stop it I'm, i want to take more photos of those people <laughs> in the rain i just found the the place it's called kampong glam g-l-a-m mm -hmm. kampong means village uh it's kampong glam it's pretty much right in the center of the city and the mosque is called sultan mosque and i think that's the area that you're talking about that that whole area around there it's very popular with tourists uh, and for a good reason um, but what you mentioned about the di different ethnicities and backgrounds, I think that's what makes Singapore so special is that it really is a crossroads. Literally, it, it is because of the location. It's on this like shipping channel that's connecting more or less, you know, Europe, India, Asia, all together. The ships have to pass by there, you know, so there's just centuries of, 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 um, you know, it's a port, port city and there's, it just has that history and that mix. And that's what I like so much about it. Like you said, you have the Indian heritage, you have the Chinese, you have the Malay. And then you also have this large expat community of just people from all over the world who, who settle down here. And then all of that mixes into the food, which is the other big reason that we haven't mentioned to come here. But it's like while you're taking photos, you can just have this amazing food as well. Um, which, yeah, it's not that expensive. If you eat at the hawker stalls, you know, it, it's not that much more expensive than any, any other place. Um, so one, one other place that just I thought of, I just did a video, YouTube video, about a place called, uh, it's, I, well, the video is going to be titled The Last Village in Singapore. And the village is called Kampong Lorong Buang Kok. And it's literally the last village. There's, there's no, you know, has these um, corrugated steel roof houses. There's only like 20 of them left. And it's, it has a really old world feel to it. And all around it are these modern apartment blocks. It's quite a ways out from the city center though. It's not something you'll see, you know, in the popular tourist spots but it's become very popular here with the locals because of COVID they can't travel. So everybody's going there. Um, so there is still like a, a lot of different things to, to see old and new here. Although the old is, is quickly disappearing. Yeah. I hope they, they still preserve some of it to, to give that, that character. I mean, it's a, it's a matter of heritage, right? So that would be absolutely heritage. The locals is, uh, talk about yeah. The locals talk about that. I mean, they, there's local photographers. Um, I'm drawing a blank on the guy's name. He has one where he's photographed all these old apartment blocks, you know, before they get knocked down. Some of them are already demolished. Um, is it David Co? maybe? I can't remember. I'll, I'll send it to you mm -hmm. so you can put it in the show notes because it's sure. definitely, if you want to see some really amazing work, from a local photographer in Singapore in terms of architecture and capturing and trying, you know, wanting to preserve the past, um, you should definitely um, check out his, his stuff. Let's uh, um, talk about something else for a minute. Uh, st still about Asia, still about uh, places and destinations for photography, but it just, just occurred to me to, to ask you this question. If you have a, a place that uh, you would recommend people visit, especially photographers in, in Asia, Southeast Asia, or any place that you've been to, that is not yet um, a very popular destination, something too off the beaten track, something yet to be discovered. I know you're putting there a bit of a spotlight there. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Um, that's a good question. It, it feels like everything's been discovered. 
but I'm sure it hasn't. The only thing I could say is to go to a country and go off the beaten track. Uh, for example, Mongolia. I was in Mongolia in 2007. I know a lot of people go to Mongolia. They do the 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 um, the hawk eagle hunters. Mm-hmm. You know, people go out west do the eagle hunters. I did a. I didn't do that. Uh, I did a uh, a tour to the west uh, in a van with four other people and a driver. But like halfway through, I jumped out of the van and and I just went off on my own. I had the most incredible adventure. Uh, it's on my website. I wrote. I, I share some photos. It's called Seven Days with Nomads or something like that. Um, so, for me, Mongolia would be a big one. Um, I was in Myanmar in 2012. That was way off the beaten path. At least it felt like in 2012. I, I haven't been there since. I think you have. No. Um, Oh no. Okay. Um, but so the, the, of course the big places in Myanmar, uh, Bagan, Inle Lake, um, you know, all of the, those are the main tourist destinations, but there's other places, um, in the far West or, you know, I, I think that's the kind of thing you have to do, go off the beaten track. Also, I think of like Indonesia, places like Indonesia, everybody goes to Bali, everybody goes to Borobudur, you know, there's like the, the main kind of spots you hit. But um, if you just go off the beaten track a little bit, there's just um, so much. Indonesia has so many islands. Some friends of mine talk about Sulawesi. I've never been there. Or Sulawesi. I don't know how Sulawesi, to say it. Yeah. Um, I, would, I was planning to go to Sulawesi a few years ago. Then we decided for some other destination. We wanted specifically to go and see those... Um, those villages in the mountains where they take their dead and they put them on the on those uh, uh, on the on the cliff side, you know. Right. Right. Yeah, when, when they do this funeral, the very elaborate funerals, where they the people are dead, but they keep them like mummified for for weeks, because when yeah. they do a funeral of an important person, they're like the, the chief of the village or some somebody notable. There's literally hundreds of thousands of people that need to travel all across the island to come to that village. And it might take them a long time to go there. So the funeral thing extends for, for weeks. And then they put the dead on the face of this cliff where you can see that they're all dressed and, and open there to uh, mummify in the open air. And then eventually they take them down or something. And there these, these funeral ceremonies where they, they sacrifice bulls and they it's it's something that I always wanted to uh, what's the name of I don't remember the name of the area but it's in, in center Sulawesi hmm. it's become a bit touristy again I, you know as, uh, how <laughs> the tourist mass tourism tourism scourge is kind of getting everywhere so uh, I heard that you, when you get there. Uh, this, those streets are full of uh, hawker stalls where they sell kind of things, trinkets and whatever, which are probably made anywhere but but there. But still, uh, those ceremonies are are the real thing, and there are probably villages in the mountains there that have not yet been discovered. So, so yeah, Sulawesi would be great to go. Yeah, I think everything. I mean everything has been discovered. I mean, with the internet, everybody traveling, social media, everybody's been going everywhere. But one thing I think about is, you know, I mostly travel for photography. Like you see a photo and you like see some place and you're like, I want to photograph that. And you travel to take a picture of that place. And in the past, when I got started, like when I did this trip in Mongolia, I traveled because I wanted to travel. And then I took photos to document my trip. And I didn't really go there. I, I was just getting into photography. This was 2007. And so I, I wasn't, you know, looking for the epic locations and like, oh, I got to go there and I gotta, I'm going to get the shot. It was just went there and then whatever happened unfolded. And I think we kind of lost that way of travel. We're so focused on, you know, social media and you know, also you just, you want to take those photos, those kind of iconic photos. So 
but really it's like, well, what's undiscovered? It's like you have to just pick some place and, and go there. Um, I'm not against traveling to shoot or photograph icons. I do it myself, but there's always a part of me that it's like I kind of have to remind myself, hey, what if I just go to some place and see what happens in addition to doing the other stuff? So. Yeah, it's, it's a bit what I was saying before, like I did this summer in Italy, right? Going, wanted to visit some iconic places that exactly. I've never been to, but right. so, many, so many places along the road from point A to point yep. B that, I mean, especially in Italy, it's, I was, sometimes I see photos of my fellow Italian photographers and I see a castle atop a hill and it's beautiful. And I, I have no idea where it is. I have to ask because I've never done thousands i don't know how many castles we have in italy but it's thousands literally and there's always some someone i have not seen and i see it and i see it's beautiful and it's beautifully preserved and i wonder where is that and i have to ask right. and I, now i want to visit it and I, you can just find it on uh, going from from one place to another one there's always right. something to, to see and find and just get lost in. Uh, it's, what, what I also like doing in Venice, it's one of the, my favorite places for just getting lost. And as, um, I was talking with um, Mark de Tolenaire, who was a, a guest on the podcast as well. Uh, some time ago, he's, he's not Venetian, but he's been living in Venice most of his life. And he, he, has, a, he has a presentation about photography in Venice where he says that I don't know how many million people visit Venice every year, or they used to visit. The thing is, they, they come to Venice, they go to St. Marco Square, they go to the Basilica, they go to the Bridge of Sides, uh, and a few other spots. And you go there, and there's a million people congregated there. But then you just walk a little bit further out from those areas, and there are wonderful corners that still preserve that uh, feel of the old Venice, and there are very few tourists there. So you can just, in getting lost in Venice is incredibly easy because the directions are hard to follow. Uh, and sometimes you think you can go from this spot to the other spot and then you find out there's a canal in between and the, the nearest bridge you have to walk all the way to, to the left and then go back to the right and you get on the wrong bridge and you get lost. I always get lost in Venice, but the fun thing is you, it's rewarding to get lost there because you discover new things. And when you want to find your way back, there are signs on the, on the corners, most intersections that say it's this way to San Marco or this way to Rialto. So in the end, it's, you will find your way. And it's also an adventure because you don't know what, what you're going to stumble on. You don't know what to expect. You're not exactly even sure where you're going. And so the photographs that you take along the way, if you do, get a great shot. I think it's more memorable. And even if you don't get a great shot, you have a wonderful experience. Whereas if you go to Venice and you say, I'm going to get a, a photo from the Bridge of Sighs at sunset. And if when you go there, the sunset isn't a good one, you feel bad. Or if, if there's 20 photographers and they're lined up uh, on the bridge and you can't get a good spot and you can't get your shot, you feel bad. So it's like you're focusing on getting you know repeating that same iconic shot rather than walking through and let you know whatever unfold naturally happen yeah and just to be honest i mean i've got nothing against the iconic shot and if you go to a place for the first time why, why not try to to get because there's a reason why some spots are iconic it's because they're sure. beautiful i mean i could I how could i say anything against iconic shot when I'm recording this video and in my back, there's a photo I took in Japan of the famous Chirato Pagoda. And if I move myself, you can see the top of Mount Fuji there. This is the well, I, iconic I've been to spot Mount, in Japan. Yeah. <laughs> the one, right? So. I've, I've been to Japan. I've wanted to, and to Tokyo, I went to Mount Fuji, but I didn't go to that spot. I didn't actually uh, go with a photographer friend when I went. And so we went actually to hike up the, Fuji and I never mm -hmm. did like that place and I always in the back of my head I uh, regret a little bit that I didn't go to that spot where where you, where you have that photo from right now so I want to take that shot too it, it is it's, it is a beautiful place uh, with the right yeah. uh, light conditions uh, this pagoda with the the Mount Fuji the iconic Mount Fuji 
uh, in in the back. It's uh, it's really great. The, it's popular, of course. I mean, I was there, and was they, they at some point? I think they the, the, the place where you shoot this is on a a little uh, hill with some trees. Just uh, because you're higher than than the pagoda. I mean, you're at mm-hmm. the level of the roof of the pagoda, right? So there's this little slope down the, the, the mountain, and they, they put their steps because at, at some point it was probably so crowded that people would just slide off the mountain and just take everybody down with them. So they put those steps, and then you have to you have to go early if you want to shoot the sunset. You have to go early before sunset just to uh, get a good spot in the front row. Otherwise, you would be in the second or third row, and you will have to Leave the camera above your head to get a shot. You cannot use the right. tripod and so on. But so yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's got all of the negatives of the of an iconic spot, too popular, but it's still beautiful. So there's I wanted to go there. Go. Yeah, there's a reason people go there, and a reason why I went there, even if it cost me uh, going back on the bus to Tokyo and <laughs> on a traffic jam for five hours. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Yeah, I should have taken, it takes about two hours on the bus to go to there from Tokyo. But on the way back, it was, I think it was a Sunday. And like everybody had gone to the lakes to spend the weekend there. And then everybody Sunday night was going back to Tokyo. And all everybody on the same highway. So it took us five hours. <laughs> oh. Yeah, anyway, fun stories. I wish I would go back to Japan as well. Um, so let, let's talk about, uh, we, we talked about the physical world, which is in many ways still uh, restricted and limited. I wanted to talk about the virtual world for, for a moment, because like, uh, I mean, we are shifting our perspective, moving from uh, doing things in person, in locations and so on, photographing or doing workshops, tours, whatever, to doing them more and more online. It's not like we were not doing that before, but many people realize this is the only way I can still do things, still teach people, still do education and workshops and so on. So uh, here you've been expanding in that direction a little bit. So can you, can you tell us what, what you're doing there? I, mean, I would yeah. love to give you a little of uh, uh, spread the word about what you're doing. I know you've got a, a community there, which is interesting, right? Not a lot of people like me with webinars, courses, and workshops, but you also have a, a community going on. So can you talk, tell us about that? Yeah. So about a year and a half ago, before COVID, <laughs> I, I actually started moving uh, more online. I tried, we, so we set up a tour in Hong Kong and then the, we filled the tour and then there was a, the protests in Hong Kong. And so we had to cancel the tour. And so I was like, oh, this is not good because, you know, what's happening in these other countries can also affect whether or not you can run your tours. And then after that, we said, hey, let's do a tour in a place that will never get canceled. Let's do one in Provence, in the, the, the fields of Provence. And then after that, of, uh, COVID hit and, and we filled that tour and then we had to cancel it. And so... As all that was happening, or even before that, I was kind of looking at a way to create a kind of online community and and school. Uh, I've run online communities before, like Facebook communities. Uh, When I was in South Korea, I started one in in Busan, South Korea, where I lived. We did meetups and had contests and, and just made a lot of friends, had a blast. And I just love the community aspect of photography. And so, yeah, a year ago last summer, I started the Creative, uh, creative Collective for Outdoor Photographers. And like I said, it's a, it's a community as well as a, a school where people can learn how to do uh, photography, outdoor photography, mainly landscapes and cityscapes, night photography, and so on. And where can people yeah. find, find that? Do you have a... Oh, if they go to either my website, thenomadwithin.com, um, or also landscape, 
landscapes with Pete or landscapepete.com. You can also find it there. Okay. Um, so there's, just, there's links, we'll put a link um, in the show notes for yeah. people who are listening and just want to go there now. Okay. So yeah, there's um, inside the the community uh, or the collective. There is we do uh, challenges like monthly challenges, photo challenges. There's also workshops. So we have uh, guest experts come in and, and talk and teach. Uh, I also do some teaching. Also, I do um, a live Q and A session twice a month. So if, if anyone has any questions or whatnot, or they just want to talk about photography, there, there's an opportunity for that as well. And if people want to get feedback on their photos, that's another thing. We, you know, if you want an image critique or something like that, you can also get that. How many members you have? Right now, there's about 20 members. Mm-hmm. And you manage it all yourself? Manage it by yeah. myself, yeah. So you, you always have to be available for questions and so it's. Well, it's not like um, it's not like a twenty four seven thing. It's usually mm-hmm. in the morning when I wake up, I'll check in, and then in the evening, you know, or, or midday, I'll, I'll check in as well. So it's not something, and it's it's something I enjoy doing. the The reason I did it is initially when I so I used to teach English at a university in South Korea. I did that for almost eleven years, or eleven years, and when I left. Um, Korea to pursue photography full time. The the thing that I liked about education is that you there's a journey. You know, like you know your students, you you follow them through the journey, you see them learn, you see them grow. And so the first thing I did when I um, quit my job teaching English, I made this a, a course and I sold the course. But after selling the course, it's like you make the course, but you you make it alone. You put it out there and then somebody purchases it and then there's just like a, you know, a receipt, you know, a, a, that you got paid or whatever, which is great, but there's really no connection with, with the people who are learning, with the students. And that's one of the things that I really enjoy. I mean, occasionally people write back and say, oh, I enjoyed the videos or I, you know, this was helpful or whatnot. But for me, having a, what I got from the community was that you yeah, you get to know these people, you get the support of a community, um, and you kind of get to know the, these other people that you're, you're working with. So for me, that was always the big draw, more so than just making a video, recording it, and I don't know. I think that's what's, for me at least, I know it's not for everybody, but for me, the, the missing piece was uh, that with everything that we have right now is, is I don't think there's any real... Uh, I don't know if that's the right way to say it, real interaction. You know, everything's like uh, on, on YouTube, everybody says, oh, you're part, we're part of the community, but there really is no interaction. It's just people commenting on somebody's video. And the same thing with, with um, Instagram. It's always just, you know, great shot or whatever. So, so the, the value is in the, is in the feedback that you also give uh... Right. The feedback, the friendships, the support. Um, for me, that, that's always what's helped me grow and learn the most and what I enjoy the most. So that's kind of what I've always been, been wanting to recreate. Yeah, it's, uh, you may make me think of my experience, which is starting to learning to play the piano. Right? We, we talked about the, this between us but, uh, recently, like in September, I said, what, what can I do the whole winter long if we cannot travel much and so on? I, I want to, something that I always wanted to, to do was to uh, learn play, playing, learn how to play an instrument and learn about music. So I got myself a little electronic keyboard and I started playing piano and then I got an app that I can follow and I've watched the bazillion YouTube videos. But as you said, yeah, there's, some, there's not a lot of interaction. There's not a lot of feedback there. So I'm feeling like at some point I want to have a personal teacher that teaches me how to play piano and looks at me playing, even virtually, right? You can do it today. I can send a teacher a recording of myself playing or do it live and they can correct my, my mistakes and everything. So that, that's important with, with photography too. Well, you, a lot of times like you, you, 
have a video. It could be about photography or cooking, piano, whatever. And you have a question and there's no teacher to ask, you know, Mm -hmm. or they say, yeah, you can send in this or that, but there's really no, it's not a human connection, I think, or as deep of a, of a human connection. I don't know. You, I, I just always enjoyed meeting my teachers, seeing them face to face, uh, seeing other students, being part of a, of a class, you know, that feeling. Cause when, I don't know about you, but I have, uh, hours and hours or gigabytes of, of things that I've bought to learn and I never finish them. You know, I, I don't, just do the first 20%, 30% and I just stop. And if I, I don't know, I feel like if you have a class, if you have a teacher, somebody to hold you accountable, and then you're, you're sharing this common experience, I'm more likely to, to complete it. Um, But again, I know that's not for everybody. That's just the way that I learn the way that, that that's always helped me is that kind of learn by doing that experiential learning. That's something that I always felt was missing and something that I, you know, wanted. So your uh, plans for the for the future is to maybe expand your <coughs> your yes. community and w- what else do yep. uh, I know you've been doing uh, still where, where you can do them you've been doing uh, like photo walks or little workshops in person um, yeah I've done a few here in Singapore but they've limited the number of people you know you can't be in a group of more than five people so I've done but I just do a few small groups from time to time because of course you know i'm talking we have zoom it's great to talk with people over zoom but there's nothing like the face-to-face interaction so i think for my plan at least for now while this you know while we can't travel is to really focus on the online business and then um you know building the 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 collective and once everything kind of clears up and we can travel again, then I would definitely like to do some photo tours. But I don't know. In the past, I was thinking of, oh, I'm going to run tours all the time. But now um, maybe I'll just do one or two a year or two or three. I don't know. Like, I don't know if that's going to be su- the main focus of, of what I want to do. I, for me, I think that the, the collective is going to be the, the foundation of everything. Yeah, I mean, doing photo tours is it's always been kind of a risky business. I mean, not, not risky, but uh, was the, the word, it was not something really sound and solid. I, I know people have been living off photo tours for, for many years and have been sure. very successful and making good right. money doing them. But it's always been something that, I mean, you could, just you could have problems, like you could have health problems or not be able to, to run tours uh, as frequently as you used to the two, or people are shifting to new destinations that you don't know. So it's, all, it's a kind of business that it's hard to keep going for many, many years. Only very few people manage to be very successful at that. And I, I found it myself starting doing it. It's, it's incredibly hard, but then something can happen like a global pandemic and every, from one day to the next, everything is shut down and you have to find other things. Your main source of income for many people can just disappear from one day to the next because of something that was totally unexpected and unanticipated. Or, or it could be your own health. You know, something could happen to you, and then you you are not able to travel. Um, so, yeah, it really depends um, what your goals are, what you enjoy doing. Um, yeah. Okay. It was nice uh, conversing with you again. Okay. Yeah, not, like, yeah. not like we don't do it every week, but with our <laughs> listeners, they don't have the privilege of being part of our weekly conversations, very interesting ones. Right. But, so they can, uh, they were able to, to see you if they're watching the, the video version or hear you if you're uh, listening to the, to the audio podcast. And, uh, well, this is cool because this, this, your podcast is the only one that I've, I've been on more than once. So I feel like we're developing a kind of history here. Yeah. So I, I got to come back. Not, we're not going to wait three, another three years for the, for the third episode. But if you, I'd, yeah, it'd be fun yeah. to come back and do we'll try to do it more often future. now that the podcast is back on the, on the air. Yeah. Okay. Congrats. Thanks for your, for your time. I know you're 
uh, ready to go out for dinner. So I don't want yeah. to <laughs> uh, hold you anymore stuck to okay. the microphone. But it's well, thanks been, for having me, Hugo. It's been great. Piacere. Talk soon. Molte, molte grazie. <laughs> Molto grazie. Molte grazie. <laughs> Prego. That's how you say you're welcome. Okay. All right. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.